presentation is made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt. I uh, appreciated everything you guys had to say. Uh, and as I was sitting there in the back, I uh, had uh, various thoughts and feelings. But one of the feelings and something that I even wanted to get to in my talk and, and just didn't get there. Uh, and when one of the things you may feel when you go to talks by people on a stage and you hear about all the things they're doing, the, the parenting, the pastoring, the faithfulness, the, the, the example you set in your, with your wife and your kids and everything else, and you walk away, you could feel like beat up. And you could feel like, man, I am I am not that, uh, or I don't do well there, or I I've, I've, I've fall so far short, right? Uh, and so I, I feel that sitting back there listening to these brothers and how, how good they are at what they do and how faithful they are at what they do. And what came to mind was 1 John 2, and that Jesus Christ is not only the propitiation for my sins, but he's my advocate. He's pleading my cause. And so I just want to encourage you, as you exert energy and effort, grace-driven effort, to be faithful in the pastorate, faithful at home, a faithful follower of Jesus, you seek to work hard, and then you find yourself stumbling, you find yourself falling, you find yourself sinning, that you should not fall into despair. You should fall into the arms of a Christ who paid your debt, propitiation for your sins, right? He's paid your debt. He satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf, and he's pleading your cause. He did not be whisked away to heaven to put his feet up and retire, right? He's pleading your cause advocate, right? Ongoing ministry. So as you seek to lead and be faithful, you're going to fall, you're going to fail. We all do, and our hope is Christ. Uh, we run to, so just as much as your people need Jesus, you need the gospel. So I wanted to start there. Uh, now the first question, I want to turn to Jason. I'm going to ask a few questions to get us going, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for your participation. Uh, I'm just going to ask that you stand up, say your question loudly, and then I'll try to repeat it uh, so that everybody knows what's going on. But Jason, I want to ask you, this struck my mind, you're, you're pastoring in Wisconsin, and you decide to leave there to go to a mess sounds fun can you talk about <laughs> why sure um yeah so there are a lot of ways to answer that question oh i, I think this might be the most helpful so we had uh, my wife and i had sensed that um well god had given us a fruitful ministry at a church in wisconsin and wisconsin was actually home for me, we just were sensing that, um, and I'm sure lots of you have experienced this, it's complicated even sometimes to explain, but just sensing that the Lord was bringing our time there to an end, we were more open to something else. Um, we had talked through a couple of different scenarios, and then I got uh, a call from uh, the chairman of the search committee, and he asked, he said that my name had been submitted or given or, or, or somehow he had gotten it. And he said, uh, I would like to tell you about our pastoral opening. Would you be interested in, in hearing it? I said, sure. And he told me the story and he said, um, do you think that's something you'd be interested in talking more about? And after hearing it, I said, probably not. Um, only because it was, it just, I, all sorts of things are going on. I don't know if I would be the right person for that. That that sounds like a very complicated situation. Would I would I be able to lead well through that? Of course, he said, would you pray about it? And I said, yes, I'll pray about it. And then it, it led to some conversations, and there were a couple of things that happened in those conversations. One, um, it was a conversation that uh, had elders and some church members as part of it. And I asked the question, uh, to the group, I said, why, why have you stayed? Uh, there are lots of good churches in the Twin Cities. Why, why have you stayed? And uh, a wife of a brother who was on the call said, um, in tears, she said, because this church is our family. You don't leave your family when things are going rough. And I was struck by that. 
that was just such a mature answer and that was so encouraging and then a little bit later in the conversation I was asking again I said what does a redeemer need and another a, a wife of a different brother on the call she said um, choking back tears she said we've had a preacher we've never had a pastor um, she said when I read New Testament texts about a pastor I have no idea what that's like um, and I was, again, so struck by that. So that led us then to meet with the elders, a couple of whom are here. And as soon as we walked in, they, they were, even in their pain, they were so warm and they were so kind. Um, and they were, there was so much wisdom in the questions they were asking. We got in the car after the first marathon day. And uh, my wife, Karen, said to me, oh, we're doing this, aren't we? And I said, probably. <laughs> um, and then the Lord just kept bringing us through the process. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it has not been easy, but it's been a wonderfully rewarding ministry. I just keep thinking of Jesus. Um, uh, God doesn't lean away from a mess, right? He steps mm -hmm. in. And uh, I think that's just uh, that's the thought that comes to my mind as you're talking. So way to go. Well done. And thank for your faithfulness. Andy, uh, I have two, two things for you real quick. I uh, want to go to the, this one first. We just talked before we came up here, listening to you, how you lead your family, uh, how you invest in your wife and your children, your, your daughter's reading. The, me, you guys are memorizing Ephesians, and, and I wanna, they're not memorizing parts. I know the Nacellis. You're the memorizing. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So you hear this, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I am such a failure. Uh, I'm sitting back there like, I have, I am not the dad I should be. I should repent. It will take me a year to repent of all my sins because you're, you're doing such a great job. I, I mean that as an encouragement to me to be there. And yet somebody could walk away uh, and just feel burden. And then somebody might be tempted. And I, I think I said this earlier, particularly young guys, younger guys are often tempted to do this, go to a conference, hear great things, and then go back and implement everything at once. Mm. And then all of a sudden, wife is like, what are we doing? We're doing Bible study tonight. We're memorizing Ephesians. And what else are we doing tomorrow? And it's like, and they're just exasperated. And so can you give us some <laughs> guidance on, I've not been doing exactly everything he's doing, but it's all a good idea. How do I get there? Baby steps, a little bit at a time. By the way, I don't think of myself as an expert on this. When, when uh, Joe Rigney asked me to speak on this topic, I'm like, I've never really done a seminar on just parenting. I usually exegeting the passage or something theological or some issue, which is way easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this one, I had my wife give me detailed feedback on the talk, had my oldest daughter read it. Uh, it, was, it was good. Uh, how many of you in, in here are my former students? Okay. I'm looking around, uh, and some of you, I remember when you took you know, first semester Greek, you weren't very good. Um, I, I thought I was pretty good. Uh, you memorized the NASB, and then you came in and, yeah. <laughs> but you got better. So my point is, look at you now, hopefully you're keeping it. Uh, but by the time you graduated, you guys were a lot better. So you could... At the peak of your skill, hopefully it's now, not when you graduated, but at the peak of your skill, that's pretty impressive to someone who doesn't know any Greek, right? So that could be discouraging, or to some personalities, it's like, all right, where's the bar? Let's do this. It's like someone who wants to become a Navy SEAL, and they haven't even gone to boot camp yet. It's like, what do I need to do? Let's do it. And they, you have to just have a mindset. This is going to take a long time, and it's going to take commitment and sacrifice, but it's worth it. So for being a good husband and, and father, it's baby steps. Implement bit by bit, and you pick up stuff when you're around other godly people. So I, like, I got the idea of monthly daddy-daughter dates from a, a friend, John Aloisi, the professor at Detroit Seminary. He has like eight or nine kids. I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow. So he does it on the, like, the birth date of each month. So if they're born on like June 3rd, it's a third of every month. Uh, oh, that's really cool. So I got ideas like that from another guy, and I pick up stuff here and there and implement what works. Yeah. Thanks. And I do mean it. You are an encouragement in that way. That, that <laughs> way. Uh, one more question right back to you, Dr. Nacelli. You mentioned gentleness, and you, you had things you wanted to say there. And the reason I know that is because you said, oh, you can ask me about that on the panel. So 
I'm asking you about that on the panel. What particularly motivated you to speak about gentleness the way you did? And what's going on in the culture do you see yeah. that caused that? I think the, the comment I made is that wisdom is necessary to be gentle. And I didn't unpack that. Why do you need wisdom to be gentle? So there's a debate I'm having with some of my colleagues. It's a good-natured, friendly debate. There's no tension. But the debate is, is gentleness a universal virtue, meaning you need to be gentle at all times without exception? Or is it a situational virtue uh, where it should be your disposition? You should be gentle most of the time, but there, there are times where it actually would be sinful to be gentle. Those are two very different views, aren't they? And what I did, I just don't have time to show my work. What I did is I, I tried to look up every Hebrew or Greek word and, and passage that's related to gentleness and then systematize them and just think through what's what. And here, I'm just going to share my conclusions because this is a panel and it's supposed to be short. Uh, so my conclusion is that the situational view is correct. So, for example, if I see a little kitten being gentle, how I treat that kitten is different than how I treat a pit bull that's attacking my kids. Or he mentioned a dog coming after his kids. You don't be gentle with that pit bull. <laughs> that's the wrong virtue. <laughs> uh, and you need wisdom to know when to use which virtue. You don't always need to be like Mr. Rogers. Like I think I mentioned Gandalf. He didn't fight a Balrog every day. He was usually, dispositionally, a gentle guy. But when the situation called for it, he was ready to be tough. So the text that people have in mind to argue against what I'm saying, well, there's the main one is this one, for, uh, 2 Timothy 2. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but kind, and the CSB translates that gentle, kind or gentle to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Here it is, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So the argument goes, look, even if you're engaging a, an opponent, you're supposed to be gentle. That sounds to me like it's an all-encompassing virtue. You should have it at all times. So let me just hold that view up to some scrutiny here. Uh, Paul wrote that text, and he wrote some other stuff too. And I would assume that what he writes other places is consistent with what he writes here, um, based on my view of inerrancy. Tell me if this to you sounds gentle. And I could have picked a dozen passages. I'm just going to pick one. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. What do you think? Gentle? Gentle emasculation. <laughs> so he's basically saying, you know, you guys are theologically wrong about circumcision, and I wish that the st those false teachers wouldn't stop with the foreskin. It's, it's pretty graphic. And in other passages, he goes after people by name. He warns us to mark those who cause divisions. There's, it seems that he's got this category for dispositionally gentle but ready to be tough when it, when it, when it calls for it, like a shepherd with a, a lion or a bear or a wolf. Um, and a few more reasons, I think, support this, and I'll pass it over to you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, do you want me to come to you with a rod? or in love with a spirit of gentleness. So he contrasts coming with a rod and coming with gentleness. Okay, that, that's a significant argument. Uh, another is Proverbs 15, which I quoted, uh, uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. Also 25, 15, there are two Proverbs that suggest that you need wisdom to know when to use that soft, that gentle register, and when not to use it. Kind of like answer fool according to his folly, don't answer fool according to his folly. You need wisdom to know when to do this. And then one more argument, and that's that the Lord himself is not always gentle. Sometimes the Lord pours out his wrath on people. And I wouldn't describe that as gentle. So uh, my conclusion is we need to be dispositionally gentle. That's our, our default. Uh, we should, as a posture, be friendly and generous and considerate, uh, and especially when we're trying to win the person. But when it's protecting the flock, it may look a little different. That's a short answer. That's really good. Um, and it's one of the reasons I so appreciate you is your just uh, attentiveness to the text and arguing these things from the Bible. Jason, as you hear that, I just wonder, and you may not have much to say here, so you don't have to make things up, but um, as you hear that, do you see, I mean, you spend a lot of time with pastors. 
Pillar Network, all the stuff. Do you see this kind of gentleness conversation? I see it online all the time. Is that something that you guys have talked about, uh, Pillar Network, or things you're seeing in the culture is kind of a problem right now, maybe in the SBC world that we're both part of? Anything come to mind there? Yeah, it's not so much about the, the situational nature of gentleness. It's that you're always supposed to be humble and not an idiot. Um, Accurate. Right? Like, so when we're when we're interacting with pastors, it, and it tends to be especially, you mentioned social media, uh, an online presence, like they're they're every hill they find they want to die on, and there's just no sense of humility in their interactions with other people. And it's not that it's it's not even that some of the issues they're dealing with are not serious issues, but the manner in which they're interacting with people is is not marked by humility even a humble strength and courage um it's just pompous it's their their uh know-it-alls their um you know, or parroting other people's arguments so it, it's not so much that what i was thinking is well that is um situational there are things that aren't like humility I think one of the things that you sh we should all be aware of is know ourselves and which flip, which switch flips easiest. It's like some guys that I know, I think the the switch that gets flipped all the time is the is the tough, tough. I'm, I'm ready to do that. I'm ready. I want to do that part. And the gentleness is like they don't have a, they don't like that switch. They they don't ever want to flip it. Uh, and then some other guys though, some other guys is the. They flip the switch of gentleness on all the time. It's like a gentle, kind, nice, and they never, they never have the, the courage to be tough when it needs to be tough. And so I think part of that's knowing yourself, and you, you want to be gentle and kind, and yet you need to be willing to have the tough conversation and, and be willing for people to say when you have that tough conversation, oh, you're not being very gentle. Be willing to, to just make sure it's not true of you. It's like, well, this moment, I need to speak this hard word. Does that make sense? You wanted to say something. Uh, it's not necessarily a pushback to you guys. It's a no. That's fine. It's we a like clarification. Uh, when you say everyone needs to be humble, of course. However, your perception of what humility looks like in a situation may be wrong, and someone may be being humble, but you mm. think it's proud. So just remember, as you evaluate people on the virtue of humility in such situations, your subjective evaluation could be off. Mm -hmm. That's good. Just remember that. That's good. All right, before we open it up uh, to you guys, one last chance here to mention re this is a track on leadership. So resources that have been helpful to you guys to think about this idea of leading others. I'll go first, and then you can jump in with just maybe a couple of mentions. Uh, I have some uh, three, three things to mention. One is a book called Leading from the Second Chair. Uh, and so I found that book helpful many years ago, probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago I read that book. Uh, particularly if you're not the lead guy in a church, you're still leading, but you're not leading from that first chair, that senior, maybe senior pastor seat. And so what does it look like to lead from the second chair? Uh, it's a really helpful book. The other is not a Christian book, uh, and so I wouldn't read it with my staff. Uh, it's got some language in it. It's called Extreme Ownership by Jocko. Uh, so here's a military guy, and uh, I've, I've found that book very helpful. And then the third thing are biographies. Uh, so just this month I've read the uh, biography of Sproul, Packer, and Lloyd-Jones, uh, and I find reading about these great leaders of history helps me to learn to lead. So I'll go. I'll start down there and then finish with Dr. Maselli. Uh, I would recommend the, that every pastor read the letters of John Newton. Um, I think over the last several years in particular I would say that I have learned more about pastoring well from the letters of John Newton than any other source outside of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So got into the practice quite a while ago of just reading one uh, every day. Um, as I come into the office, one of the first things I do is grab a notebook. Uh, one of the gals in the office printed out all the letters are available on monergism. Mm -hmm. She printed them out, put them in notebooks, and I just read a letter for that day in it. Um, He's pastoring me, and he's instructing me how to pastor people well. I mentioned the book by Tim Whitmer, The Shepherd Leader. There's one he wrote. I couldn't find the title. It's like Shepherd Leader at Home or something like that. It's, that's excellent. That was helpful to me. And then 
anything by Doug Wilson on the family. I've read all of them multiple times and so, so helpful and practical. Okay, questions. Anything um, that you want to ask, we'll take it. Yes, sir. Speak up. 45% deaf in my left ear. Thankfully, you're on my right. Yeah, it's really good. So, 10-year-old son uh, loves to be silly, loves to play games, Pokemon, things like that, but also want to balance that out with some seriousness. You're at a conference called Serious Joy. So, we've got you. Um, <laughs> I'll say one thing. I'll turn it over to these guys. Uh, I think it's – so, you, you talked about or used this idea of studying real things, uh, but I think there's a whole lot of value in making sure your imagination – is set free, right? So I'm not a huge fiction guy. I've read the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, but I also love the movies. Uh, I, I've read, <laughs> I've read The Hobbit. I like the movie better, uh, and so uh, I I know that we're Tolkien people. Uh, I'm a fan of that new show, and I watch. I can't remember the title now. What is it? The Keys to the Ring. Stop! 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 <laughs> so. It Most of the people who come to our school are not like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some of them are like me. Let the, I think fostering an active imagination, so balancing that out, studying the real world, absolutely what God has made, what God has done, uh, but also this imagination. My son fights in our neighborhood. There is not a bad guy that exists in the woods any longer. He's fought them every day for years. And so I think there's, there's, that's healthy, so I wouldn't run, run away from that too quickly. So I think it was in Doug's book, Future Men, uh, where he talks about uh, understanding how your children, each of your children is wired differently. And in the way they're wired, look for the things you can correct and the things you can commend, uh, redirect. And so I would think really carefully about, like, what is it that's underneath that? And... Um, and how can I commend that, um, enjoy some of that with him, but maybe redirect it as it needs to be redirected? Um, but I would, I would again, um, I, I would look for ways to commend him um, and even talk about the way you love the way God has uniquely wired him, uh, that he loves these things. And um, my dad, uh, one of my heroes, uh, made this distinction for me that I think carries over when so you raise four boys um, two of us are pastors now he was attending a church where my brother and I were pastoring uh, together and there was a Sunday where my son who's now 14 I think he's probably four years old he was just being he was being four um, and I was getting so frustrated and I was not frustrated with him because he was sinning I was frustrated because he was four and I didn't want to be embarrassed as a pastor by how crazy he was he was acting, and I flipped, and I, I was sinfully angry with him. And my dad pulled me aside, and he said, uh, how old is Jonathan? As if he did not know. I said, he's four. He said, okay. He said, don't discipline your son for being four. Discipline him for being a sinful four-year-old. I said, yes, sir. Um, but that's been helpful to me, that distinction between like, there, there's a natural way our kids are at their different stages of development. And that's not always um, like immediately sinful. Future men. I, I'll say what? I do not remember anything else in that book. So <laughs> do not. I'm not necessarily commending the whole book. I, I just would, remember. It's, good. it's very okay. good. There you go. 
I'll, I'll just say one more thing, and I may be wrong, I don't know you, um, but I heard in the way you frame things, and again, just be hearing you, it's almost like imagination was like, oh, that's fine, but we want to do the real serious thing. And one of our colleagues right now is actually working on his dissertation on Augustine and imagination uh, and the importance of the imagination. So again, just to, he's 10, and I think an act of imagination is fantastic. I, I actually encourage my, my I have an 11-year-old, uh, and he has he is dead set or he thinks he is uh, on being a, a naval aviator um, because he watched Maverick and uh, that's that's what he's going to do. I haven't squashed that one bit. I'm like it's going to be real hard. And you know what? And now he pays attention in math class because he's like, oh, they have to know math. I'm like, yeah. It's like I, I got so he's like studying math on his own. I'm like fantastic. Um, <laughs> but just in, to encourage that imagination. I heard that maybe you were saying, imagine us down here, let's take serious things, and I wouldn't pit them against each other. Well, I'll let me start. Go for it. So we planted a church, uh, 2016 in Northfield, Minnesota. So just 45 minutes south of here. Took 22 members from the South Campus of Bethlehem. That was our core team. And when we started, <coughs> we um, we had met with I had met with the church, the evangelical leaders in town. It's a very liberal town. Um, but I met with the the guys that I thought I'd get al along with. Um, theologically and talked about planting and you know we want to you know link arms we don't want to compete but partner for the advance of the gospel all that and then we planted <coughs> and people started coming and as I got to know these people they're coming from other churches in town uh, and one of the things the, the conversation I always take people to coffee loved coffee let's go grab a cup of coffee love to hear your story and I'd always start just wanting to hear about them things like that uh, but also to tell me about where you're coming from uh, and uh, talking about uh, that there are good reasons to leave churches and there are bad reasons to leave churches, and we want to. Sh and there are good ways to leave churches and bad ways. So good reasons, bad reasons. Good ways, bad ways. And so, like, why are you leaving? That's a reason. And then, have you talked to your <coughs> elders? Have you talked to your pastors? Ways of leaving and having that type of conversation. Now, the reality is, I'm living in Northfield, and there are churches that I wouldn't call churches. Right? They've abandoned the gospel. They're flying uh, LGBTQ stuff. Uh, they got female pastors, all kinds of all kinds of things going on, and there's not a whole lot from. I know why they're leaving, and I think they're right. I think they're right to get out, and so we, we welcome open arms. There were other people leaving some of the evangelical churches in town because all of a sudden there's a Reformed Baptist church in the city uh, that had never existed, and so they start coming this way. And there's a little bit more of a conversation with them to hey, what's going on? And my biggest concern was, do your pastors know that you're visiting? Do your pastors know? And if you had, if you were unwilling to talk to your pastors, you couldn't be part of our church. You, you could come. I'm not going to lock the doors, but you're not going to be a member unless your pastors have had a conversation with you about transitioning over. And some people were coming from fairly healthy churches, but found that they just aligned with us better. Uh, they were uh, not theologically, missiologically. And they felt like they could be used there. And that may not make their pastors real happy, but I didn't think that was a sinful reason for them. And so those are some of the conversations we'd have. Yeah, so um, the first conversation with people in, in that situation was about leaving your church well. And what does that look like? I think the trickier part comes when the issue... Uh, surrounded the church leadership and um, they may have attempted to do things properly and in a healthy way and it it was not received well and so then the leaders of the church actually became one of the major sources of them looking somewhere else I don't think there's an easy answer to that I think you have to pray for wisdom I think there is safety in a plurality of godly men that you can submit yourself to and even submit those conversations to. 
Um, and then um, there's a difference for me between someone attending and then someone wanting to make the step of membership. Uh, so someone, someone could be trying to figure stuff out and attend Redeemer, and I hope we minister God's grace to them through the word every week. Um, and I hope it's a, a generally a sweet place for them to be where Christ is exalted every week. If they're wanting to pursue membership, then I think it's unavoidable that you have to get into some nitty gritty conversations about what took place at the church. Um, and as much as possible, it may be a slow process, which I think should be fine. Um, but you've got to figure out, um, what, what has happened, what's going on and, um, yeah, what do we need to talk through before you can join this church in, in the healthiest possible way? You mentioned the phrase church hurt, uh, and so that's, people are using it all the time. Are you, are you, so, 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 so you want to say anything about that phrase, the way it's being used, or helpful, unhelpful? The unhelpful way that people use church hurt, I think, is when they are easily offended, quick to harshly judge the motives intentions of another person and then tell other people about it assuming that their perspective is omniscient and it's our, when people tell us those kind of stories it puts us in a little bit of a bind like mm -hmm. i want to be sympathetic to you i want to be kind to you and and listen but what i must not do is necessarily agree with everything you say that's not required because their perspective could be wrong so you're, you're as much as possible you want to be objectively just and that might mean asking hard questions it might be saying hey can we go talk to these people and help uh, reconcile um, there be, may be another side of the story that you're not hearing that's not to say that they're liars I'm not saying they're, if they're hurt hurts real the subjective hurt is real but their subjective explanation may not be a hundred percent factual and the reality is as I talked about in my talk there are churches that have hurt people that's right that's, that's, that's a real thing, uh, and, and that's that's wicked and sad, and we should lament it, and we should help people work through it, which is why I think we've got to be able to ask the questions, and I think in our current cultural moment, one of the things that you're not allowed to do, according to the culture, uh, is ask the question. You just have to assume that they are, that what they're saying is correct, not that they're telling you the truth, but it's correct. That's the interpretation piece. So don't ask them any questions. And so this is, you know, D uh, Joe Rigney has been so helpful here in some of his writings on empathy. Uh, and it's not that he's saying you shouldn't be empathetic. It's that the way the, the term is being used, the idea is untethered empathy. It's, it's I just jump into the river with you and I ask no questions and I don't keep my hand on the tree to hold, to pull us both out of the muck or the mire or the water. Right. And so uh, we live in a moment where church hurt is like if I tell you the church has hurt me, all you need to do is listen to me and agree with me and don't push on anything I say. That's that that's not helpful. That's that's wrong. And it will not serve them and it will not serve the church. And so I think when people use that phrase church hurt, um, you know, it depends on who they are. Case by case, realize that church hurt can be real because pastors are sinners and churches are full of sinful people. Uh, and at the s and we need to dig in a little bit and ask questions in compassionate, loving, kind, tactful ways. Right here, yes, sir. Yeah. So. Um, it, it does not mean that we do it for show, um, but what we try to do is um, look for opportunities to honor one another, as we're commanded in Scripture, uh, to point out evidences of grace in each other's lives, to thank each other for the ministry that we're receiving from one another. And so that looks like for us primarily in our members' meetings, and then sometimes during our Sunday services when it's appropriate. Um, so uh, during our members meetings, it's, it's probably easier and more natural because we're, the way we do it is we're giving updates on all the different ministries of the church and it's an easy thing for me. So uh, Aaron who's on staff is sitting right here and then Jason in the back. It's easy for me in that setting to just take a moment and say, 
I just want you to know, brothers and sisters, how grateful I am for Aaron and for the job that he's doing selflessly discipling our young adults. Or um, some of you don't know this, but um, the amount of time that Jason spends uh, working his way through uh, the business of the church so that he can present it to you in a helpful way. Um, I want you to know that I'm so grateful for him. So I think doing it in that setting and then on Sunday mornings, we share the pulpit. I think that's a practical way to do it. So uh, when these guys don't just preach when I'm gone, but they preach when I'm sitting there with my family and I'm taking notes and I'm uh, I'm receiving their ministry. And then often when the next person preaches, they'll say something like, um, grateful to God for the wonderful exposition we heard last week from Aaron or from Jason. So How many it's Sundays do you preach a year? Jason? 35. Yeah. Um, so shared ministry and then taking opportunities, uh, again, not to do it inauthentically or for show, but I'm, I'm genuinely grateful for these brothers. Um, so I just think having a, having, um, a desire to do that and then looking for opportunities uh, to do it, those would be some of the obvious ways. And then I think, I think people then look at it. So they, so they see us interacting on a Sunday morning. They see us interacting at our members' meetings. Um, and again, we're not doing it for show. This is legitimately we enjoy being together, um, and so we we don't shy away from that, and we we'll talk about it. Um, uh, it will be a sermon illustration once in a while, or there may be some good-natured uh, joking in some of our. Uh, sermons as we bring up an illustration that lends itself to, you know, giving another pastor a hard time. Uh, so, yeah, we think that's appropriate and helpful for the congregation. David. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I would say spend time, spend time with them, and in the time you spend with them, have the expectation that they can offer you something. Um, so ask them questions. Ask for their advice on things. I, I understand that guys have differing levels of maturity and they have differing levels of experience, but um, if, we're, if we believe that there are biblical qualifications for an elder, then an elder is an elder. Um, and the calling is the same calling. And so God is, I assume God has put that younger elder in my life for my benefit. Uh, so when I get together with them, I'm going to ask for their advice. I'm going to ask for their input. Um, I'm going to ask for their prayer uh, for needs uh, that I have in my own life. If there are ways in which I'm struggling as a father um, or or other ways in which I need prayer, I'm going to submit myself to my other elders. We're to take time in our elder meetings for everybody uh, to give personal updates about their life, about their marriage, about their parenting, about whatever they want to bring up, and then we're going to pray for each other by name, and everybody will participate uh, in that. Um, I'm not going to chair elder meetings, which would be a nightmare practically, but I also think it's there's wisdom in like I I have enough influence preaching as much as I do in the position that I'm in. Um, I want to hand off uh, things as much as I can and and benefit from the other elders. Those would be practical ways. I'm going to close this out. If you have other questions, we'll be here for a little bit. Uh, we hope that this has been helpful, uh, and I'm praying uh, that the rest of the conference would be encouraging to you. You have a break until 7 p.m. tonight, and you're here from Chancellor Dr. Pastor John Piper, and so be back for that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. You may go in peace. Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. 
For more information, visit bcsmn.edu.